Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm here today for an important announcement on a big expansion of Alberta's COVID-19 vaccination program, one that many Alberta families have been waiting for eagerly. But first, I'd like to offer a more general update on encouraging news around the current COVID-19 situation in the province. It's been just over two months since we implemented targeted public health measures and launched the restrictions exemption program. I want to thank every Albertan who's done their part uh, to follow the guidelines, to get vaccinated, and just to look out for one another. Thanks to your efforts, we've got through the peak of the fourth wave and continue to see encouraging trends. There are now about 5,000 active COVID cases in the province, the lowest level that we've seen since August 13th. That's 4,800 less active cases than a month ago and about 15,000 fewer cases than two months ago. The positivity rate, that's the percentage of the number of tests we take that uh, turn out to be positive, well, that's averaged 5% over the last week, which is a sharp drop from the average of 11% in, back in early October. This shows that targeted public health measures and rising rates of immunization, vaccination, have worked to slow the spread of COVID-19. Today, there are 475 people in hospitals across the province with COVID-19. At the peak of the fourth wave on September 27th, there were a little over 1,100. Today, there are 94 Albertans in ICU with COVID, and at that peak, there were 266. Now, despite this significant drop in hospitalization numbers, Alberta's healthcare system remains under pressure, caring for those with COVID-19, plus the, all the other illnesses that are out there. We've begun to reschedule surgeries put off during the fourth wave, which means that ICU beds are once again being occupied by patients recovering from major operations. Fortunately, beginning this week, an additional uh, 391,000 Albertans will be eligible for a COVID-19 vaccine. After completing a thorough scientific independent review of the clinical research data, Health Canada approved the Pfizer vaccine for use in children aged 5 to 11 years on Friday of last week. This is exciting news for hundreds of thousands of families across the province who have been eagerly awaiting for vaccine protection for their younger children. I'm happy to share that the wait is basically over. The Pfizer supply for children arrived in the province today and the teams at Alberta Health Services and Alberta Health are working to get them distributed to more than 120 locations across the province over the next couple of days. So starting tomorrow morning at 8 a.m., parents and guardians will be able to book first dose appointments for children between ages 5 and 11 to help protect them, their loved ones and their our communities from COVID-19. Minister Copping will provide additional details on the booking process in a moment. We are ready quickly to safely administer vaccines to those uh, between 5 and 11 year olds. This is welcome news for many parents who will log in, I suspect, first thing tomorrow morning to book their kids' vaccines. But I also know that some parents, despite choosing the vaccine for themselves, may have questions about whether it's the right choice for their young ones. So if you are unsure, hesitant or you'd like more information, please reach out and speak to a trusted medical professional. Whether it's your child's pediatrician, your family doc, a community pharmacist, pharmacist or one of the nurses at the 811 Health Link service, well, there are many medical experts available to answer your questions and give you the information that you need to make the right decision for your child. We want parents to take the time they need to assess their situation review the data, and make the best choice for their kids and their family. And that's why children aged 5 to 11 will not be subject to the restrictions exemption program. Alberta's government is not imposing any kind of deadline on families to ensure that they don't feel rushed, because we don't want people to feel rushed or pressured, I should say. The pandemic has been a trying time for every Albertan, and young, younger children and their parents are certainly no exception. Kids have had to sacrifice a lot in their young lives to help keep others safe, from missing in-person learning at some times and extracurricular activities, to time away from grandparents and other family members, missed birthday parties, sleepovers, and time spent just being kids. Ultimately, 
we felt that it would be unfair to younger children to exclude them from fur and to further stigmatize them, especially given their low risk uh, for severe outcomes from COVID-19. But the bottom line is this. With the addition of more than 391,000 Alberta children, almost 94% of our total provincial population is now eligible for the life-saving protection of COVID-19 vaccines. With each dose administered, we get one step closer to minimizing the threat of this virus and forging our path out of the pandemic. If you're among the 12% of eligible population who have not yet received your COVID-19 vaccine, please do so now, it's never too late. And if you're eligible for a third dose, a booster shot, get it as soon as possible so you can have increased protection against COVID-19. And just to remind folks, that's available to anybody 70 years of age and over, and all Indigenous and Métis people over the age of 18. I've said before, and I'll say it again, vaccines are the single most effective tool that we've got, so we need to use them to our full advantage. Thank you to every Albertan who's been vaccinated and to every young Albertan who is about to, to get vaccinated. You're making a big difference in our collective fight against COVID-19. I'll now invite Minister Copping to provide some additional information on the pediatric vaccine program. Thank you, Premier, and good afternoon, everyone. I'm honored to be here today as part of the announcement. And I know that many parents have been anticipating Health Canada's approval of a COVID-19 vaccine for children ages 5 to 11. As a parent, I understand. While the waiting was definitely challenging, it's reassuring to know that the Pfizer vaccine went through a rigorous review and has been deemed safe and effective for young children. The expansion is important for many reasons. First, it's the best tool that we have to protect the health and well-being of these young Albertans. Even though they have a very low chance of severe outcomes from COVID, it can happen and we want to, prevent, to do everything we can to prevent that potential outcome. Second, having more Albertans of any age vaccinated will help to further limit the spread of COVID-19 in our province, which will help to keep everyone safe and ease the strain on our health care system. Lastly, immunization will help these youngsters get back to being kids and spending time around others with reduced risk of catching or spreading COVID-19 to someone that they love. As the Premier mentioned, the Pfizer vaccine doses for these young children arrived in Alberta today. Our healthcare staff on the front lines and behind the scenes are ready to receive them at administration sites across the entire province. And before I get to the booking details, I want to add my sincere thanks to these teams for their tireless work to keep our provincial vaccination program running smoothly and efficiently over this past year. Immunization will be by appointment only and children must be at least five years of age to be eligible. Unlike previous stages where we have staggered the rollout by phases, any child between the ages of five and 11 can have their vaccination booked. Bookings will be open tomorrow. Wednesday at 8 a.m. through the province online booking system at alberta.ca backslash vaccine or by calling HealthLink at 811. The first appointments will be available starting this Friday. COVID-19 vaccinations for 5 to 11 year olds will take place at 120 AHS clinics across the province. At this time, they'll also be administered at four pharmacies where AHS clinics are not as conveniently available. Children who live on a First Nations reserve can also access doses through local public health clinics and nation station, nurses stations on reserve. These young children, just like adults, will require two doses to be fully vaccinated against COVID-19. Current data suggests that the strongest immune response is achieved when doses are given at least eight weeks apart. Given that evidence, second doses will only be administered a minimum of eight weeks after the first dose. Dr. Hinshaw will provide more details in her remarks. Tempting as it may be to try and book an appointment for your child now, I ask folks to wait until tomorrow and not flood 811 with calls before then. However, you can pre-register your child in the Alberta vaccine booking system today to help save a bit, in, bit of time. There have already been 43,000 registrations to date. 
There will be enough doses for every parent who wants one for their child. How long it will take to book an appointment will depend on the response from parents. There will be a rush initially, so it may take a little longer, as with every stage of the vaccine rollout. We think up to half of parents may look to book right away, and AHS should be able to accommodate that many kids within about the next two weeks. Given the importance of vaccination, the federal government now requires that Canadians 12 years and older show proof of vaccination to board domestic and international flights, as well as to get on passenger trains. I'm pleased to share that Alberta's QR code vaccine record will be updated tomorrow, November 24th, to meet the recommended Canadian standard for domestic and international travel. If you already have your QR code vaccination record and aren't planning to travel, you don't need to worry about the updated version. You can continue to use your already saved or printed vaccine record with the QR code to access local businesses and venues taking part in the restriction exemptions program. If you are planning to go on a trip soon, visit alberta.ca backslash COVID records beginning tomorrow to get your new record and make your trip that much easier. In closing, I'd like to thank all Albertans who have made the choice to get vaccinated. It is because of you that we're getting through our fourth wave and easing the pressure on our hospitals and all our healthcare workers. And for those who have yet to get vaccinated and still may be hesitant, please reach out to a trusted healthcare professional to get advice, or you may dial 811 to talk to another healthcare professional. It's important that we all get vaccinated, not only to protect ourselves, our loved ones, but also our healthcare system. And to those healthcare workers, once again, I would like to sincerely thank you for your tremendous work. My whole focus is to support you in getting through this wave, to help you get back to giving all your patients the high standard of care that you're used to giving, and do everything we can to avoid disrupting our health system again. Thank you, and I'll now invite Dr. Hinshaw to provide her update. Thank you, Minister, and good afternoon, everyone. Before I get to today's update, I'd like to share a change to the recommended interval for mRNA vaccine doses for adults. Based on emerging evidence, the Alberta Advisory Committee on Immunization has recommended extending the interval between first and second doses of mRNA vaccine to a minimum of eight weeks for all those who are currently eligible for vaccine. Evidence shows that a longer interval between doses can result in higher vaccine effectiveness that may also last longer. This means if, if you have just received your first dose, it is strongly encouraged that you wait until eight weeks have passed before you receive your second dose. The interval between second and third doses for those who are eligible remains the same at six months after the second dose. The other information I want to share before getting to today's numbers is a recommendation we have received from the Alberta Advisory Committee on Immunization regarding use of the Moderna vaccine in those ages 12 to 29. We have been closely watching our vaccine data and the data from other jurisdictions. And at this point, it seems clear that while still low, the risk of myocarditis following Moderna vaccine is higher than following Pfizer vaccine in those who are 12 to 29. As I mentioned, the risk of this outcome is still very small, with approximately one case per 7,000 doses in 12 to 17-year-old males. That's with Pfizer, and one case per 2,000 second doses with Moderna. Risks following vaccination are even lower for those age 18 to 29, and it is also important to remember that myocarditis after COVID-19 infection is more common than after any vaccine. As a precaution, however, starting today, we will be advising that anyone between the ages of 12 and 29 receive Pfizer vaccine rather than Moderna. For those in this age group who have already had Moderna vaccine, there is no ongoing risk. If myocarditis happens after vaccine, it typically happens in the first one to two weeks. And after that, again, there is no ongoing risk. We know there may be some who would still like to choose Moderna, 
as our data indicates, it is slightly more effective. And this informed choice is still possible. However, at this point, we do preferentially recommend Pfizer vaccine for adolescents and young adults. On to today's update. Over the last 24 hours, we have identified 253 new cases of COVID-19 and completed about 5,300 tests. Our positivity rate was about 5.2%. There are currently active alerts or outbreaks in 133 schools. Two of these schools have had 10 or more cases who were infectious in the school within the last 14 days. As you heard, there are currently 475 people being treated for COVID-19 in hospital, including 94 in the ICU. Sadly, 10 new deaths have been reported to Alberta Health in the last 24 hours. I am saddened to share that this includes the death of a child under two years of age where COVID-19 was a contributing cause. While I will note that this child had complex pre-existing medical conditions that played a significant role, this does not diminish the tragic loss of one so young. My thoughts are with the loved ones left to mourn this individual and all others, including anyone who has had to say goodbye to someone they cared about, no matter the cause of death. I want to assure Albertans that before we publicly report any COVID deaths in someone under the age of 18, we complete a thorough review process. These reviews are also done in any cases where there is uncertainty in cause of death for those of any age, so the overall COVID numbers we are reporting are as accurate as possible. Again, I offer my sympathies to everyone who has suffered loss from every cause. Every life matters and every death matters. We know that the most effective way to limit transmission of COVID-19 and prevent serious outcomes like hospitalization and death is widespread immunization in people of all ages. That fact makes the approval of the Pfizer vaccine for those aged 5 to 11 even more important. After a thorough and independent scientific review of the evidence, as you know, Health Canada has determined that the benefits of this vaccine for children aged 5 to 11 outweigh any potential risks. The clinical trial data showed that the vaccine was 90.7% effective at preventing COVID-19 in children aged 5 to 11, and importantly, no serious side effects were identified. The trial also showed that the immune response in children 5 to 11 years of age was comparable to the immune responses of people aged 16 to 25. This is wonderful news. Already in the US, over 2 million doses of vaccine have been administered to children ages 5 to 11, with few adverse events reported and no safety signals. Children between the ages of 5 to 11 will be offered a pediatric dose, which is 10 micrograms. This is one third the dose of 30 micrograms given to children aged 12 and over and to adults. Not only has the pediatric dose in children been found to result in a similar immune response as the dose for older adolescents and adults, the pediatric dosing has been shown to reduce the risk of side effects for those in this age group. In addition to the Health Canada announcement, the National Advisory Committee on Immunization released its recommendations on extending the interval between first and second doses for children to at least eight weeks. This is based on the evidence in adults, as I spoke about earlier, that suggests a longer interval between doses can result in higher vaccine effectiveness that lasts longer. It's also based on evidence that suggests that it may reduce the risks of the very rare potential side effect of myocarditis. My team and I have thoroughly reviewed all of the data and recommendations from Health Canada, NACI, and the Alberta Advisory Committee on Immunization. And this has formed the basis of our guidance on immunization for 5 to 11 year olds in Alberta. This includes ensuring that there is at least eight weeks between first and second doses and encouraging parents to consider the benefits of offering immunization to children in this age group. If your child was recently immunized with another vaccine, such as influenza, it is also recommended to wait 14 days before having your child receive the pediatric COVID vaccine. This is a precaution. While we have seen with older age groups taking other vaccines with the COVID vaccine, this has been safe and effective. However, 
This spacing for 5 to 11 year olds is recommended to allow us to watch more closely for any potential adverse effects. While most children who have been infected with COVID-19 have had only mild disease, a small number have experienced severe disease resulting in hospitalization. In the past 120 days, 13.4% of all cases in Alberta were in children aged 5 to 11. And in that time period, 26 were hospitalized, including three in the ICU. As with all COVID-19 vaccinations, we will carefully monitor the administration of doses in Alberta for any adverse events and will report those publicly, as we have been doing since our vaccination program began. As a parent of children in this age range, I join in the relief of many parents now that there is an effective vaccine available for use. I also understand that some families may have questions or feel uncertain about getting their young children vaccinated. It's only natural to want to do the best thing for your kids. To help answer these questions, I will be hosting a telephone town hall next Tuesday, joined by other physicians to answer questions about vaccines and children. This town hall will be open to anyone who is interested in this topic. A registration link will be available online. It's free for anyone who wants to call in and ask a question about this issue. I also urge you to speak to a healthcare professional for information about the pediatric vaccines. They can answer your questions and help make sense of the data. This is another milestone day in our fight against COVID-19. I believe that the expansion of vaccine eligibility to these young children will help us further limit the spread of the virus, which will in turn help prevent Albertans of all ages from experiencing serious outcomes from COVID-19. If you're eligible for vaccination against COVID-19 and you haven't yet been fully vaccinated, please do so today to help protect you, your loved ones and your community. Thank you and we're happy to take questions. Thank you, Dr. Hinshaw. That concludes the formal portion of today's announcement. We're now going to move over to our media Q&A. Uh, just a reminder to everyone on the phones to please press star one to join our queue. Uh, and a reminder to the folks both on the phone and in person here to please direct your question at either Dr. Hinshaw, Minister Copping, or Premier Kenny. Uh, as well as folks at the mic, please introduce yourselves with your name and your outlet. Go ahead, Lauren. Hi, uh, Lauren Boothby with the Edmonton Journal. Uh, question for Minister Copping. Hello. I'm just wondering if you're going to run vaccine clinics in schools um, to make them more accessible to people and maybe that's not happening now just because of a limited uh, quantity? Yeah, so we're not running them in schools at this point in time. Uh, we're rolling out the vaccines for younger kids at the 120 AHS clinics because that's the best way for the scale of the program. Um, as you may be aware, we actually ran clinics for kids in junior high and high schools, um, and that wasn't all that successful. Um, of the uh, uh, 700 of the 1,300 schools that, that were offered actually canceled. Um, we did run it in 591 schools and about 4,000 doses. Uh, so given the scale of the program, we're going to use what's tried and true, which is the AHS uh, high throughput clinics, um, which, was, which has been successful to date. Um, and then it's also, you know, being mindful of the, the vaccines themselves. Uh, if we distribute it out to all schools, uh, there's a risk if, if we don't have the uptake, uh, there could be some, could be, could be some wastage. So uh, we believe that with uh, the method that we have here, the, the 120 uh, locations, uh, we can actually, over the next two weeks, get the first surge done. And then we'll take a look after that. Okay, do we need to do cleanup at, at schools after the fact? Uh, but we'll have to wait and see. All right, um, my second question also for you, different topic. Um, so the holidays are coming up next month and I'm sure people are wondering if they're gonna be able to spend time with their family uh, this year. Um, and I'll, also I'm sure you're probably still like ironing out the details and you have to probably look at the cases, but um, what's the indication right now for people who are vaccinated or maybe not vaccinated, um, will they be able to spend holidays with their family this year? Yeah. Yeah, so we're, we're still looking at that. The, uh, the cases are, are coming down, but we're still at roughly just 120% of to, you know, our standard ICU capacity. Um, so we are having conversations. We're looking at the numbers. Um, uh, this seems to be perhaps plateauing a little bit. So we're going we're gonna to quite simply have to wait and see, but, but stay tuned. This issue is, and uh, you know, we've heard from lots of Albertans who are asking questions about when do we come out of the fourth wave and making changes, but I can tell you we'll be, we'll be very conservative. 
Janet French from the CBC. Just to follow up on the schools, I mean, the 7 to 14 shots that went into schools, that was quite a while after those shots were available for that age group. So we talked to a pediatrician and a group called Support Our Students who said that it makes no sense to avoid offering COVID vaccines in elementary schools, um, particularly given that other childhood vaccinations are already offered there without spoilage. Um, and they say it's actually politics and ideology that are driving this decision. I'm just wondering if you can respond to that. Yeah, so it's nothing to do with politics or ideology at all. It has to do with you know the, the best approach to actually getting it out and getting it out quickly uh, without concern, concern of wastage. That's, that's what this focus is on. It looks like the Premier has some thoughts on that. I would just supplement by saying, you know, obviously we've we've heard some of the the feedback from that parents who are very concerned about uh, about forced vaccinations or have requiring vaccinations to attend school. So I'm wondering if that was a factor in your decision to not create that impression. Well, uh, first of all, in response to your question about whether this is about politics or I think you said ideology, I'll, I'll note that uh, today British Columbia has announced effectively exactly the same approach as Alberta. Uh, they have a, a government of a different stripe. Um, this has nothing to do with politics. Uh, uh, I'll encourage you to look at the announcement made uh, by uh, British Columbia. Uh, they've indicated that uh, a lot of parents have said they want to be present with their kids when they are being vaccinated. Uh, and uh, it'll be a lot easier to accommodate that at uh, large flow through vaccine administration centers like we'll be operating here. Um, the, as uh, we, we are expecting very large uh, demand and volume in the first couple of weeks, um, our, we've done some public opinion research on this and have found that approximately 50% of par parents with children in that age range um, have decided to get their children uh, vaccinated. So, um, you know, that's upwards of 200,000 uh, kids. And, and uh, we, we have only, by the way, we only have only so many so much capacity to administer and deliver at a program of this scale with that many uh, children where we're expecting very significant demand up front. So again, the most efficient way of doing that, of handling that uh, large demand, allowing parents to be present and participating, uh, is to do what British Columbia is doing at, uh, at large flow through uh, clinics. Um, but I think it is important to underscore that uh, Alberta has never had uh, mandatory vaccines for school participation. Um, and in fact, uh, that would con contravene uh, the Education Act, which requires that, that students be able to access the schools regardless of their health status. Uh, so uh, I know that Minister LaGrange has uh, reaffirmed that with the school boards. Just to follow up about the restrictions exemption program, obviously you've noted here that that won't be applying to children under 12. Um, but children can obviously also carry the virus that causes COVID-19 and spread it. Could this potentially undermine the point of the restrictions exemption program if kids aren't included? We're not concerned, uh, as you know. <clears throat> One of our primary concerns that led to the restriction exemption program was the very high number of unvaccinated uh, adults ending up in intensive care. 90% of the ICU population with COVID have been over the past several months unvaccinated. Um, we have only one a person in uh, ICUs right now under the age of 18 with COVID. So we don't, have any, we don't have anything like the same kind of risk for pressure on the healthcare system emanating from children in this age bracket. And while it is possible that, uh, that children can, can be infected and can, can transmit, um, it is uh, the, the much greater concern in terms of healthcare pressure comes from adults. Hi. Audrey Neveu, Radio-Canada. I'd actually like to hear you in French on what you just said. Um, Est-ce que ça ne mine pas, en fait, le but du programme d'exemption de, des restrictions? Effectivement, le programme a été informé par la pression sur le système de santé et sur les hôpitaux, particulièrement les soins intensifs, parce que 90% des gens avec COVID-19 dans les soins intensifs étaient les adultes non vaccinés. Alors, euh, nous voyons euh, aucune pression euh, de même ordre provenant des jeunes enfants. Effectivement, aujourd'hui, il y a seulement un an, une Albertaine de moins de 18 ans dans le soin intensif euh, avec COVID-19 euh, par rapport à 97 euh, euh, adultes. Alors, euh, pour protéger le système de santé, ce n'est pas obligatoire. Mais je, je dirais également, and I'll come back and say this in English too, that 
we are concerned about the disproportionate impact that COVID-19 has had on the on uh, the mental health and well-being of children and youth. Um, their lives have been dislocated in so many ways, and we don't want to add to that uh, at this time by enrolling them in the forcing them into a program when in fact they don't constitute a threat uh, to the healthcare system should they become infected at, at any mm -hmm. significant level. So, um, alors. Uh, euh, ça veut dire que euh, nous nous inquiétons du, euh, euh, excuse-moi, nous nous inquiétons de l'impact de COVID-19 sur la santé mentale et le bien-être des jeunes et des enfants euh, avec tous euh, les changements dans leur vie pendant les dernières 20 mois. Alors, nous ne voulons pas euh, faire davantage de, de conséquences négatives pour les enfants non vaccinés, qu'on ne sait pas nécessaire pour protéger le système de santé. Um, shifting gears, I'll ask you in English, but would like to hear you in French um, about TC Energy's uh, trade claim on KXL. Um, TC Energy said that it would not resuscitate the project. So what does Alberta have to gain? And is there not a risk of making the relationship with Washington worse off because of it? Well, it's not Alberta that made the, the relationship worse off. It's President Biden who uh, insulted his country's largest trading partner by uh, arbitrarily cancelling an approved project that could have helped his economy. The President Biden is pleading with other countries to open their strategic petroleum reserves. He is pleading with OPEC to increase production and shipments. And his country is receiving 840,000 barrels a day of oil imports from Vladimir Putin's autocratic Russia. Uh, coincidentally, Keystone XL would deliver exactly that quantity, 840,000 barrels a day of heavy oil to uh, US refineries. So I th think that the, the project ha was m clearly in the best interest of the United States. I would hope that the administration would take a, uh, would reconsider its position given these emerging facts about a, a, a growing scarcity of uh, global energy. But in any event, we've said from day one that we believe there would be strong grounds to protect our investment uh, and that of TC Energy. We're glad to see, see, to see uh, TC Energy proceed with the NAFTA case. Um, we will be considering how best we can uh, partner with them in that. Uh, and we think there's a very strong claim for damages uh, given uh, the, the uh, Biden veto of the project. I'll say a bit of that in French if you want. Yeah. Um, pour dire que um, uh, c'était la décision du président Biden qui était l'insulte vers le Canada avec uh, un veto d'un projet qui les États-Unis euh, ont besoin parce que aujourd'hui le président Biden euh, exige que euh, les, les pays de l'OPEC augmentent euh, leur production et exportation de pétrole pour aider l'économie américaine et aujourd'hui les États-Unis reçoivent euh, presque euh, 900 000 barils de pétrole par jour de, de la Russie. Ça, ça a été euh, les exportations de l'oléoduc euh, Keystone XL. Alors, nous dirons que, euh, et nous, nous avons dit depuis le, le début que l'Alberta euh, va protéger notre investissement dans l'oléoduc de Keystone XL avec euh, TC Energy. Et alors, nous sommes heureux d'avoir l'action lancée cette semaine uh, contre la décision du, de l'administration américaine à cet égard. Thanks, Premier. That wraps up our in-person questions today, so we'll move over to the phones. Operator, can you please connect our first call? Thank you. The first call is Colleen Underwood, CBC. Hi, this question is for the Premier. Um, also off topic for today's discussion, but I'm wondering, um, on Twitter, you uh, made some comments about David Suzuki and accusing him of inciting violence and that he should be condemned, his comments should be condemned. Um, and upon closer look at the article you're referring to, he actually doesn't incite violence. Any comments to clarify what you were trying to what point you were trying to make? It's absolutely an implicit or winking incitement to violence. It's like in the gangster movies where they say, uh, you know, 
nice little pipeline you've got there, be a terrible thing if something happened to it. Uh, this is totally irresponsible on the part of David Suzuki. And let me point out a track record of outrageous comments from him that in, for anybody else would have had him cancelled. Uh, instead, he continues to receive uh, multi-million dollar contracts from the CBC. You know, uh, this is a guy who said that uh, about immigration, and I quote, this is from July of 2013, quotes, Canada is full. Our immigration policy is enough to make you sick. We pillage the countries of the South by depriving them of future professionals, and we want to increase our population. It's crazy, unquote. Uh, he, you know, if, if somebody like Don Cherry had said that Canada is full and our immigration policy is uh, crazy and sick, he would have been cancelled by the CBC in a New York minute. But instead, the CBC gave it D David Suzuki uh, millions of dollars more in compensation to work for them. This is the same guy who, who called for his uh, uh, for a political opponent, Stephen Harper, the Prime Minister, to be thrown in jail. He said in February of 2016, quotes, I really believe that people like the former Prime Minister of Canada should be thrown in jail, quote unquote, not for corruption, but because of a policy difference. When Donald Trump called for uh, Hillary Clinton to be thrown in jail, he was rightly mocked, ridiculed, and vilified, but what's the CBC's response? To give him even more uh, contracts to help sustain his four houses in which he lives as an environmental hypocrite. So uh, I don't understand why the CBC is rushing to the defense of a man who is now implicitly uh, inciting people to eco-terrorism. And Colleen, did you have a follow-up today? I do, actually, just on the fact that perhaps this type of conversation detracts from the actual issue, which is climate change. Uh, <laughs> well, if you think D David Suzuki's comments detract uh, from something, then, then he sh you should hold him accountable, not me. Uh, it's David Suzuki who is, is raised into this discussion a terrorism, political violence. That's not how we solve problems in Canada. We do the, we resolve differences uh, peacefully and democratically, not by threatening to throw our opponents in jail as he, as he did about the former prime minister of our country. So why, I don't know why uh, uh, CBC and, and others continue to rush to the defense of a man who's anti-immigration, who's called our immigration generosity uh, sick and uh, he has said that it's sick and crazy, said that Canada is full, uh, calls for the imprisonment of people in politics with whom he disagrees, and now is basically saying nudge, nudge, wink, wink, be a terrible thing if something happened to those pipelines. This is outrageous and should be called out as such. Thank you, Premier. Uh, operator, can you please connect our next call? Vincent McDermott, Fort McMurray today. Hello, this is a question for Minister Copping. Um, we saw with the initial rollout that volunteers of people we ended up calling vaccine hunters did a lot of heavy lifting on social media of getting people info on vaccines and getting uh, info on how to book them, uh, get booked for vaccines. That, like, those are lovely people, but that's not exactly a positive reflection on government messaging. Um, are there any logistical lessons that have been learned from the initial rollout that will be reflected and acted upon in this new rollout? Well, thanks for the question. So the, the initial rollout will be able to get, uh, and, and we anticipate roughly 50% of uh, Alberta parents. Uh, then after that, we'll be, be able to provide more information. Uh, we are working with, uh, you know, groups of doctors and with Chief Medical Officer of Health to say, how do we provide better information and more information to, uh, to parents, uh, be able to answer the questions. And, uh, and, and as uh, Dr. Hinshaw has already indicated, uh, she's going forward uh, 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 later in the week to do a town hall for parents because really it's about you know what we learned and, and we saw we had a tremendous example of this uh, with a table uh, that was done in uh, both in Al in Edmonton and in Calgary 
a uh, that REACH did re outreach to uh, newcomer communities and a tremendous success. Uh, for example, in Calgary, uh, the, in, in the Northeast is up to 99%. Uh, so we're actually speaking with uh, with those groups in terms of taking lessons learned of how do we can actually increase vaccination uh, for, for adults for, for 12 and over, uh, as well as be able to provide information uh, and, and, and answer questions uh, for parents who may have questions uh, about the vaccine rollout uh, for Pfizer uh, so they, they can make well-informed well and well-founded decisions. Thanks, Minister Copping. Uh, Vince, do you have a follow-up today? Uh, yeah, this is for Minister Copping as well. Um, or, I mean, anyone who also wants to comment. Uh, with respect to everyone here, for a lot of unvaccinated holdouts, it seems the more health care or government credentials someone has, uh, or, or, yeah, media credentials too, uh, the, the more suspicious they are of the message. Uh, it, it's been a year of telling adults that vaccines are safe. Uh, I, I, how are you going to win over parents now who, after about a year, are suspicious of vaccines for themselves? So we're going to continue to provide uh, information uh, to uh, to parents and to uh, to Albertans. Uh, we are also going to look at different ways that we can we can provide that information. So, for example, uh, you may be aware there's a household that went out to across the entire uh, entire province, and we're going to look at seeing can we use the success of, of groups uh, like the the Northeast Table in in uh, in, in Calgary. Uh, and, and, and the same approach in Edmonton uh, and apply that in other areas uh, across the province, which is really looking at uh, grassroots to provide the message and provide the information. You know, ultimately, it's the, the choice of individuals. Uh, but as, as a premier, premier said, part of this is just misinformation there. We need to get trusted sources of information so they can look at it and then make the choice and, and the choice for themselves, uh, for their families, and, and quite frankly, for the, our healthcare system. Okay, and uh, Premier is just going to add something further. Yeah, thanks, Vincent. It, it's a good question. I just wanted to underscore that we're now at uh, over 88% first dose coverage of uh, adults in Alberta. And that's great progress. So we're down to about 12% of the uh, adult population not yet vaccinated uh, with the first dose. So uh, I would hope and expect that that 88% of adults, uh, for those who have kids in this age, age bracket, they are at least very open uh, to and willing to consider vaccination. You're probably right. Um, for those adults who themselves have been uh, so reluctant, they have the one in 10, that they've got not got yet not yet gotten around to being vaccinated, they're probably going to be the hardest to persuade in terms of the pediatric uh, vaccine. But um, uh, I, I should point out that the largest uh, cohort of unvaccinated adults are in their 20s, and we think they tend to be uh, single uh, individuals who, who probably don't have kids. So um, these are younger people who um, are perhaps just less uh, prone to pay attention to uh, uh, issues like vaccination. So uh, we'll continue to try to reach out to them. The numbers have been moving up. We expect them to continue to. I think it's now completely possible that Alberta will crest past 90% uh, amongst adults, which is awesome. And uh, we have caught, basically caught up to the national average. We were 10 points behind and we're now about 1.5% behind. So I just wanted to, to celebrate that good news. Thanks, Premier. Operator, can you please connect our second last call of the day? Rick Bell, Calgary Sun. Uh, good afternoon, Premier. Let's go back to David Suzuki for a moment, because um, this will be something people are talking about across the country uh, today. I mean, how do you react when you do actually hear people, commentators, uh, defending Suzuki, saying, well, he didn't really mean, I know you did the nudge-nudge-wink-wink wink explanation, but how do you personally feel when you hear people saying, well, you didn't really uh, incite uh, the, um, you know, blowing up pipelines. He's just pointing out a fact that th this could happen if people get too frustrated. I mean, how do you feel when commentators try to make that argument in this particular, uh, in this particular case? And, and this is sort of a two-part question, and then I'll get to my supplementary. And, and what do you say to the people who say, ah, oh, you're just trying to change the channel? Well, uh, okay, on the second... By going after Suzuki. On the second point, Rick, uh, 
I, I have a very long track record of standing up for uh, responsible energy development against this kind of kookiness and hardly anything new on my part. Uh, nor is it anything new on David Suzuki's part. And it is sad to see so many of the Laurentian elites and others, CBC and others, rush to the defense of this guy like he's some kind of a saint. He's infallible. He cannot be possibly, possibly be criticized, even though he has a track record of saying things that would result in any mere mortal uh, going down the cancel culture uh, uh, black hole of history. I mean, as I say, um, could you imagine if Don Cherry had, had said that uh, Canada is full and immigration is crazy because we want to grow our population? He wouldn't have lasted a New York minute on Coach's Corner when it was on CBC. They would have fired him right out of the building. Instead, what do they do with David Suzuki? Uh, he said that about immigration in 2013. He gets eight more years of multi-million dollar contracts to pay for his multi-million dollar lifestyle. I'm sick and tired of it. And uh, why the double standard? Guy who calls for his political adversaries he doesn't like to get locked up. You, did, does CBC have a policy that it's okay to call for the imprisonment of people you disagree with in a democracy? Is that why David Suzuki continues to grace their airwaves at enormous taxpayer expense, by the way? So I'm seriously ticked off about this. And I am still about the fact that the University of Alberta gave this guy an honorary degree. They wouldn't give anybody else with a track record. Is there anybody else who's anti-immigration that the U of A would give a, an honorary degree to? And now, implicitly, implicitly, I believe, inciting people to political violence. Enough is enough. This guy was invited to speak to the Alberta Teachers Convention a couple of years ago. They paid him a handsome honorarium. Um, does he, I mean, what, what can he add usefully to debate about anything when these are the kinds of views that he holds? So it's time that he be held to account, in my view. And, um, you, you know, we're talking about pipelines right now, we have one that is, is being blocked by groups supported by big U.S. special interests. And if they succeed, hundreds of Indigenous British Columbians will be put out of work a project that is supported by every one of the 20 elected First Nations band councils along the coastal gas link route. So that's one of the reasons I, uh, this gets, gets my dander up, because these are rich people from urban Canada uh, inflicting their fashionable political opinions on often people living in poverty in First Nations communities that just want a shot at, 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 at a decent living. Thanks, Premier. Rick, do you have a follow-up today? Yes. Um... I know uh, we're not supposed to ask politicians to read other people's minds, but I'm going to anyway. Um, to the degree that you have a theory about it, why do you think the people who are defending him are defending him? And part two is, do you actually think uh, such comments increase the tangible, you know, do you think there is a tangible threat that pipelines could actually get blown up? So it's kind of I, I think it, I think it, it creates an opinion environment which could be seen as normalizing uh, or providing an, a, an, an apology for uh, a rationalization for violence. I think it creates a context that some people could use to rationalize violence. And that's why it's so dangerous. When Donald Trump stood in front of the White House on the 6th of January and said that we, you have to fight for this country or you might lose it. That was widely seen as indirect incitement to the violence that then f f uh, followed in the U.S. Capitol building. How is this any different? Like I say, he's basically saying, nice little pi pipeline you got there would be a terrible thing if something happened to it. So he shouldn't just be out there doing interviews saying, oh, he doesn't actually support violence. He should be walking this whole thing back, apologizing and retracting, without exception, um, because I can imagine some over-caffeinated young green radical will hear in St. David's uh, words a rationalization of future violence. Thank you. Operator, can you please connect our last call of the day? Thank you. Quinn Oler, Global News. This question for the health minister. 
if we have the doses now, why do we have to wait until Friday to start seeing them get into the arms of kids? Thanks for the question. Uh, the short answer is they just arrived today. They need to be distributed uh, across the entire uh, entire province. There's 120 different sites, uh, and then we can actually, um, you know, make sure that the, the, the count is all done. Um, to, you know that the distribution has, hap distribution has happened correctly, uh, and then we can start. So it's taken a few days. I I understand BC like they they they're receiving theirs early this week as well, and they're not starting until Monday next week. So this is standard in terms of once we receive it. You have to do the initial distribution, and then we can actually start getting them in the arms. Thanks, Minister. And Quinn, did you have a follow-up to wrap things up for us today? I do. Um, if we have 50 percent of kids getting their vaccine in the next two weeks, that puts us around 80 percent of Albertans who are vaccinated or partially vaccinated. When and what number or benchmark can we look at to have restrictions lifted? Yeah, we're, we're, we're examining that right now. Uh, there is is a you know a challenge in terms of at what point in time and we, we and I'll, I'll pass this over to uh, to Dr. Hinshaw in a second but that there's a challenge over in terms of what point in time do we actually reach that magical number of okay we got enough people vaccinated now we don't need to, need to worry about that um, the, the challenge is we you know it's it's we can't say with precision there's not enough science to know what that number actually is uh, we are seeing in uh, other jurisdictions with relatively high levels of vaccinations a uh, the start of the fifth of the fifth wave uh, so we're just going to be watching very closely and, and take a conservative point of view. Uh, but Dr. Hinshaw, can I ask you to, to comment further on that? Thanks. Thanks, Minister. Uh, that's accurate in terms of that it's very difficult to have a single number that represents the uh, protection that we would need, especially against the Delta variant. And it is interesting to look at jurisdictions such as Portugal, uh, where they have 88% of their total population vaccinated and despite that are seeing an increase in cases and a slight uptick in hospital admissions. Uh, in Denmark, where they did remove all restrictions when they reached a particular percentage, I believe they're sitting at about 76% of their total population fully vaccinated, um, where they're seeing higher case numbers than they've ever seen before and also starting to see an uptick in uh, their hospitalizations. So again, we need to be very cautious. We need to watch what other jurisdictions are experiencing, especially as we move into winter months where there is the highest risk in terms of seasonal um, impacts on transmission. Uh, so it, there's, there's no one single number, again, that we know of right now. We do have to watch other jurisdictions, uh, learn from their experience, and uh, continue to be cautious as we move through the next several months. Thanks, Dr. Hinshaw. And thanks for joining us today. This concludes our media availability. Thank you.